Okay, so the last topic for the class, linearization of nonlinear systems, which I hope gives you uh, maybe the best motivation, uh, well, the best reason basically to, uh, for this class at least, to uh, deal with linear systems because um, they are extremely useful not only by themselves but also to um, analyze nonlinear systems. Remember, uh, I mentioned in the beginning, most uh, differential equations cannot be solved explicitly. Um, nonlinear ones, there is no method of solving them. You could try, if it's suitable, like separation of variables, you could solve you know, linear, uh, nonlinear systems if the equation is separable. But in general, except uh, with specific formats, you don't have a general method of solving them, the nonlinear ones, as you, you have in the case of linear systems. So let's look at a particular problem that you may have in a real life model which is nonlinear. Um, at the very least, you should look at the equilibrium points and see if they're stable or not. Because in the model, that's essentially a way to make a prediction. If I find a point which is locally stable, I can predict that at least if you start in the neighborhood of that point, the solution will evolve to a certain value, um, that equilibrium point. Um, and before we actually delve into the actual method um, for nonlinear systems on how to use this linearization process and the so-called Jacobian method, um, I want to make an analogy with a single uh, ODEs and some stuff you actually learn in calculus because there is a nice analogy um, with the single ODEs and what you learn in calculus with what we're going to do in the case of systems. So I'm going to begin actually with um, one remark. Um, if you look at a, a graph of a continuous function, and you look at the point, and you look at the tangent line at that point, the essence of linearization is the fact that locally, around that point, the graph itself is very close to a straight line. Linearization is nothing but replacing or approximating the actual function with a straight line. That is the easiest, mathematically speaking, process, right? Because what's easier than just a linear function? There are, of course, compromises, right? Obviously, you know, if it's a straight line, the far you are from the actual tangent point, right, the worse the approximation is because you're going to have a gap between the actual function and the, and the tangent line. But you might remember in Calculus 1 that we did something called approximation of uh, functions via um, tangent line equations. And near the point of tangent, that could be a good approximation if you're close enough uh, to the point. And if the function is not that curved, right? I mean, if it's cl as close as possible to a line, that could be a reasonable approximation. So the main idea is that if I zoom in, uh, basically, um, around that point, the graph um, f of x looks like a line. It's uh, approximated by a line. Um, to put it in... Um, common terms, let's basically, if I have a continuous graph, essentially, if I zoom in close enough, it's going to look like a straight line. Whether, uh, besides the fact that, despite the fact that it's not actually a straight line. So, um, in terms of um, functions and how you actually formalize this, this concept, you might remember from calculus uh, two, I think, yeah, when you study Taylor series, that if a function is differentiable um, at a point, at the point in question, like A in this case, you can you could approximate essentially the function via the Taylor series, uh, which is a power series around that point. So f of x is approximated by f of a plus f prime of a over 1 factorial times x minus a plus f double prime of a over 2 factorial x minus a squared. And you can continue adding higher order terms until you're satisfied. The idea is that, of course, the more you add, the better the approximation is going to be. But again, if you're happy with just the linear approximation, you typically stop with the approximating uh, with the approximation right here. Okay, so you look at just at the linear part of this series. And that will be basically your linear approximation of the function. And by the way, even before we learn about the Taylor series, you guys use that in calculus one, right? I mean, you, you ended up with what we called um, linear approximation of a function. I think the notation in, the, in, uh, in calculus books is usually f of x is replaced by l of x, which 
L of X is F of A plus F prime of A times X minus A. So that was an application of the first derivative. Uh, nothing but the tangent, but nothing but the equation of the tangent line. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, what does that lead to in terms of differential equations? Well, let's say you look at an autonomous single ODE. So let's let's say you're looking at x prime equals f of x. And let's say you're looking at an equilibrium point for a single ODE, right? So let's say x equals a is an equilibrium point. Which means f, prime, f of a is going to be 0, right? Because an equilibrium point is a constant solution of the ODE. So if I plug in a constant on the left, that's 0. So to say that a is an equilibrium point is the same thing as saying f of a is equal to 0. Um, let me make this nicer here. So f of a equals 0. That's, that's another way of saying uh, a is an equilibrium point. <coughs> So how does the linear approximation may play a role? Now let's suppose this f of x is a very ugly function. I cannot solve the equation. Uh, or I want basically a very quick way to figure out uh, whether this equilibrium point is stable or not. Well, I could replace essentially f of x. So I could replace the right hand side of the ODE with its linear approximation around the point of interest, which is an equilibrium point this time, right? So the only difference is that in this case, the linear approximation will, don't ha will, will have this guy here equal to 0. Because if, if A is an equilibrium point, this is going to be 0. So the right-hand side of the ODE is essentially f prime of A, x minus A. So I know that if I'm close enough to A, this will be a decent approximation. So I can infer how the solution moves away or toward the equilibrium A just by analyzing quickly the sign change of this approximation. And if you look carefully, whether you approach the equilibrium or you move away from the equilibrium is completely determined by the sign of the derivative at that point. So let's go back to what we, uh, and that's a nice opportunity to review, right, what we did in the, in the beginning. Let's remember the phase line concept that we discussed earlier. What happens if um, f prime of a is positive or negative uh, in terms of the sign of the derivative? So <coughs> keep in mind if f prime is negative, and this is the equilibrium point, right, a. If I start above a, so if I pick a point above a, greater than a, this quantity will be positive. But because the derivative is negative, when I multiply, the overall sign is negative. So the motion is toward the equilibrium. If I start below a, x minus a is negative, times another negative, if f prime is negative, that means the uh, motion is upward. If the derivative is positive, then of course the whole signs are flipped, and the motion is like that if you start above or below. So with a quick evaluation of the derivative at the equilibrium point, you can quickly um, realize that if f prime is negative, you have a stable point. If f prime is ne uh, positive, you have an unstable point. So again, you, you may wonder why do I keep on going over this stuff when we talk about systems pretty soon. It's a nice analogy with systems, actually. You'll see immediately, except that you deal with um, a matrix of derivatives, of partial derivatives, rather than f prime of a. Uh, by a single derivative, and uh, it boils down essentially in the end to a condition on the um, eigenvalues to be negative in order to, for the points to be stable. For single of these, it's very straightforward. The analogous method is essentially to look at the derivative evaluated at the equilibrium point. Now, there's a very important and crucial thing here to notice. If, because remember, that's not equal to f of x, that's an approximation. If f prime of a is 0, then this test that we apply here is inconclusive. So the linearization simply doesn't work um, if the derivative is actually equal to 0. And if you think about a little bit how we started with the Taylor series, to say that the derivative is 0 for an equilibrium point is to say that these terms are both zero. 
So that means it's too much of an, it's, it's an unacceptable approximate. You cannot approximate this with zero, right? You will have to look at higher order terms in order to um, approximate f of x and figure out whether it approaches the equilibrium or not. So it's a simple fact that if the derivative is zero, linearization doesn't work. It's not sufficient. It doesn't give you any um, idea and on how the solution moves toward the equilibrium point. So that's why those are borderline cases, which we won't deal with in this class. But we will have a similar borderline case um, to deal with um, in, the, in the case of a system. OK, so that is essentially the analogy from calculus 1. What does this have to do um, with how you actually deal with systems of uh, differential equations? So let's actually repeat the process. And I want you to keep in mind that in the case of a function of several variables, we also have the same concept, namely a um, um, linear approximation via the Taylor series, but for a function of two variables. So I'm going to do that in the second part so I can have a ni nice enough room here. Um, but in this uh, corner that is still empty here, I want to remind you, just for those of you who didn't take calculus 3 yet, um, the concept of a partial derivative, which we're going to use um, in the next part of the lecture. Um, even if you didn't take calculus 3 and you didn't know what a partial derivative is, uh, trust me, you know already what it is once you actually, um, once I actually tell you what it means. Because it's just basically taking derivatives like in calculus one, but one variable at a time. That's, that's all I need for, um, for the next part of the lecture. So if you have a function of several variables, um, this symbol, partial f partial x, means the derivative of f with respect to x. So basically, you focus at one variable at a time, um, and you treat the other variable as a constant. That's all there is to it. It's just the, all the derivative formulas that you know, but keeping one variable at a as a constant at a time. So for example, if I say f of x is equal to x squared y plus xy third plus x plus y squared, I think that's illustrated enough. What does it mean to do partial x? Well, you treat y as a constant. That's why this one disappears, for example, because it's by itself. So y squared is like 5 squared, right? I mean, it's, it's like a constant with respect to x. Um, so with respect to x, the derivative will be 2xy plus y third plus 1. Again, you treat y as a constant. y third times 1, x prime is 1 y squared disappears completely because it's treated as a constant. When you do partial y, you flip the concept, right? I mean, now x is a constant, so that's why x will disappear here, and y is your variable. So this is going to be x squared times 1 plus 3x y squared. Yeah, x is a constant. The derivative of y third is 3y squared. x goes away and then plus 2y. OK, so 2 x partial x, 2xy, y third plus 1, partial y, x squared, 3xy squared, um, plus 2y. So we're going to need these in the second part, uh, and then we're going to illustrate how we do the whole linearization for systems. So stay tuned. <coughs>